Hi everyone and welcome to the show. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. This is episode number 11 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark on your Why Did It Have to Be Snakes podcast. But before we get into the film, we have some really exciting news to share with everyone. This episode is the first to be released as part of our brand spanking new podcast network, Eloquent Gushing. Eloquent Gushing! Woo! Yeah! <laughs> we gush eloquently! Because we're eloquent gushers. Woo, yeah. I love you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pop Culturally Deprived is the first show on the network, and we have plans to add more to the slate over the coming weeks and months. So watch this space for us to release new content about our and your favorite TV shows, movies, video games, comics, design, salt shakers, hardware, helicopters, lipstick, <laughs> Star Trek, Woodworking, singing, Twitter, napkins, Disney parks, mobile phones, and giant pits. You can find all the information on our new site, eloquentgushing.com. That's eloquent, E-L-O-Q-U-E-N-T, gushing.com. We've also made a couple of changes to this show. You'll notice them as we go through. The one you'll probably have heard already is that Matthew is now 100% a regular co-host. So he will be joining me each week to discuss the content and make sure we have those in-depth discussions that we've heard you enjoy, even if he isn't the supervan invited to indulge their passion. Thank you, Mandy. It's terrific to be promoted. You're not telling the whole truth, though. I think we can all agree I'm now co-host because we have to get Star Trek references into every episode. You are 100% right. <laughs> you bring the Buffy, I bring the Star Trek. <laughs> Challenge we- accepted. <laughs> we will highlight other changes as we go throughout the shows, uh, but I think that's enough time spent on admin, so let's get this boulder rolling. Our guest today is Steph Donning. Steph and I have been friends for many years after meeting through work, and this is her first ever podcast. You guys, I don't even think she listens to podcasts. Well, I would occasionally listen to news reels about podcasts. Does that count? <laughs> no. Very <laughs> no. <laughs> I I'm actually surprised that I'm on this podcast because I would never describe myself as pop culturally literate, but I was a child of the 70s and 80s when a lot of pop Hollywood was released, and I while I'm absolutely uneducated about film, I love stories. And I have literally seen Raiders more times than I can count. And just a quick side note, isn't it cool that Raiders is like the Madonna of movies? It's known by first name only. (laughs) That is true. You say Raiders and everybody knows. (laughs) I really like that. (laughs) I'm I'm stealing that forever. Absolutely. It's yours. Steph, I'm going to need you to tell everybody how many times you've watched Raiders since we first talked about doing this podcast (laughs) just last month. I am a little embarrassed to say that I saw it either seven or eight times since we first started talking about it. Which, you guys, was just last month. (laughs) (laughs) What can I say? It's a favorite. (laughs) Hey, you love what you love, and and that is awesome. I I think it's great. I think it's good for the show. We have 2017's foremost expert on the film. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I never watched this movie until recently. And honestly, the reason why is kind of silly. Because when I was very young, you know, under 10, probably 6, 7, 8, I happened to walk into the living room while my parents were watching Temple of Doom. And then I was promptly scarred for life because of the creepy crawlies in the tunnel and then the blood drinking. And so I really wanted nothing to do with Indiana Jones ever again after that. That's probably fair to a small child. Yeah. Or one could say, heal thyself with raiders. We can maybe talk about that a little later. (laughs) (laughs) No spoilers. Oh, uncomfortable silence. So, Raiders of the Lost Ark was released on June 12, 1981. It was director Steven Spielberg's first big action film, who previously had success with Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and 1941, which, side note, I had never even heard of. It was the highest grossing film in North America that year, and to this day remains 21st on the list of all-time earners when adjusted for inflation, which I actually think is higher on the list than The Godfather, isn't it, Matthew? Yes, I'd imagine so. That's interesting. 
Raiders was nominated for nine Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. It won in five categories, Best Art Direction, Film Editing, Sound, Sound Effects Editing, and Visual Effects. Uh, Raiders was written by George Lucas, yes, that George Lucas, in the 70s. Spielberg had wanted to direct a James Bond movie, but Lucas convinced him that he'd created a character far better than James Bond with Indiana Jones. When it came time to cast Indy, several names moved to the front, but Jeff Bridges and Tom Selleck were the top runners. But Lucas's wife preferred Tom Selleck, so they initially offered it to him. Unfortunately, he was under contract with CBS for Magnum P.I. at the time, and they wouldn't allow him to do both. After Spielberg saw a screening of The Empire Strikes Back, he instantly knew that Harrison Ford would be the perfect man for the part and convinced Lucas to cast him. Interesting thing to me was that this movie was originally rated R because of the scene at the end where Belloc's head explodes, but they were able to reduce that rating to PG by adding a veil of fire over the scene, which I actually think makes it more creepy, not less creepy, (laughs) but who knows why they do what they do. Raiders was followed in 1984 by a prequel, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, then two sequels in 1989 and 2008. There was also a TV series, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, which ran for 24 episodes and four TV films in 1992 and 93. There have also been numerous video games, books, and comics based on the character. And just like we saw with Ferris Bueller, this film was selected by the Library of Congress's National Film Registry Registry for preservation because it is culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. So a new segment that we are doing now is letting everybody know kind of how we watched the film, where we were able to access it, if it was digitally or if we actually had to, you know, watch the DVD or in some cases maybe pull out a dusty VHS. But for me, I watched it on Amazon Prime, but that is apparently only something available on U.S. Amazon Prime accounts because Matthew was unable to do the same. Yes, I couldn't get it over here, so I rented the film digitally on Google Play. But I think you got it really cheap, right? I had a, a 75% off any rental thing, so uh, 62p <laughs> it ended up being. Well, I'm really glad I didn't have to spend any pounds on this. I watched it <laughs> seven or eight times on the US Prime account, so free for me. So in case you haven't seen Raiders, if you're, if you're like me and you don't actually really know what the story is about, in 1936, Indiana Jones, an archaeology professor and adventurer, is sent by the U.S. government to stop the Nazi army from discovering the Ark of the Covenant, which supposedly holds the tablets inscribed by Moses with the Ten Commandments. We always kick off with a few familiar questions. Mandy, what were your expectations going into this movie? Honestly, I expected to love it. It's such a fan favorite. It's so iconic. And so for me, I was thinking of it in terms of, of Die Hard and, and just other action movies from, from the 80s that I've discovered I really enjoy. So I expected to love it. I think this is one of the few we've had where you expected, you know, you had very high expectations for it. Yeah, usually I come into it with lower expectations so that I can be pleasantly surprised, I think. And this one, I just went all in. <laughs> um, and what's your experience with uh, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Harrison Ford? Of course I'm familiar with George Lucas. I didn't actually watch all of Star Wars until just last year in preparation for The Force Awakens. But I have now seen all of the Star Wars movies, including Rogue One. So super familiar there. I hope nobody's unfamiliar with Spielberg because he's kind of the staple of 80s and 90s movies. Um, but he's done way more than I realized. One of my favorite movies back in the nineties when I was in middle school was arachnophobia, which is ridiculous because I'm absolutely terrified of spiders, but I love this movie. It's so bad. It's so good. And it's a Spielberg movie. So you didn't want to watch an Indian Jones film because of the creepy crawlies. Arachnophobia, however, all in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no one said that I had to be logical about these things. <laughs> Um, And how did you feel about Indiana Jones having experienced Han Solo? Part of me wants to say they're basically the same character, but I just can't do that. Han Solo is so much better than Indiana Jones, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) I actually agree with you. (laughs) You're not not saying that having just seen all of the uh, Firefly episodes? No, no, um, because I actually think Mal Reynolds is, is a better man than either Han Solo or Indiana Jones. Okay. 
But yeah, I'm, I mean, I love Harrison Ford. I think he's great. I just not a big fan of Indy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the big question, uh, did you enjoy Raiders of the Lost Ark? I did not. <laughs> you guys. So we were supposed to originally record this at the end of January and we had some technical difficulties and so it got rescheduled. And so I, I watched it, you know, a month ago. And so I thought before we sit down and talk about it today, I need to rewatch it. And so I started rewatching it last night and it was so much worse the second time around. I couldn't even finish it. I couldn't. Uh, I hate this movie. You poor I don't think I hate it as much as I hated Clerks, but I really don't like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say when I watch this movie, that I watch it very nostalgically. I was a tween when it first came out, and I'd already developed a little bit of a crush on Harrison Ford in his roguish portrayal of Han Solo. So when I watched this movie, it was a step in that direction. And the female lead, I'm blanking on her name, but it's Karen White? Karen Allen. Karen somebody. Karen. That's all I can tell you. (laughs) And so strong female character presumably we'll get into more about that through the the podcast when i watch the movie now i can just let go of all that analytic stuff that goes on in a more mature mind and completely relive the joy of watching this adventure unfold when i was a kid and i had a crush on everybody in it i don't think i'm myself as a rabid fan but i admit i'm feeling a little bit protective of my raiders <laughs> I think that's perfectly reasonable. I remember seeing this film years and years ago. It's I, I've mentioned others that we've uh, talked about on the show, it just being things that are on TV quite regularly, particularly around Christmas in the UK. Um, and this is another one in that category. So it's quite mixed up in the other films of the series. The, the third film, Last Crusade, is the only one I can actually remember being released. I'm going, oh, it's a new Indiana Jones film. And watching it back now, I can see, I can see it's, quite good fun for a younger audience but i can also see a lot of problems with it (laughs) some of which will be addressed later on um and some of which are just oh they get this so much better in the later films yeah i guess i can i can see looking at it from more of a child's perspective when you're watching this i mean Indy is this great adventurer. He goes out treasure hunting and he's got a whip and, you know, he gets to fight and, and just do all of this really adventurous stuff. And and that's the stuff that little boy dreams are made out of. And hey. so, and, and little girl dreams too. Yeah. Sorry, little girl dreams too. <laughs> I mean, I was a tomboy, but I was still a little girl. <laughs> so from that perspective, I can understand it, but, but looking at it in my 34 year old eyes in 2017, I, no, I, I can't do it, you guys. Was there a specific single point that you can identify as, like, the core reason you didn't like it? Because Indiana Jones is a douchebag. Well, or then. To, 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 to use, you know, my standard phrase, Indiana Jones is a really terrible human being. Yeah. But that's kind of the whole movie, not just a single point. Yeah. Gets to the core of the story, though. Yeah, we can talk about that in a little bit, too. <laughs> So, this movie was nominated for Best Picture. It was the highest grossing film of the year. What do you think made people respond so strongly to this film, both critically and commercially? Well, for me, I think it's a a really straightforward storyline. And like you were saying, Matthew, it really draws in kids, you know? And Amanda, you mentioned it too. As a youthful audience, that simple hero's journey is popular for the last 2000 years, you know, back in ancient Greece. So that's one thing, straightforward storyline, hero's journey. I also think they leveraged Harrison Ford. They were able to back piggyback on his success as Han Solo in Star Wars. And of course, Empire had already come out at that point. And uh, sidebar, that's another Madonna type movie. You just say Empire, everybody knows. (laughs) Yeah. I think in in that context, as far as timing goes, it almost couldn't fail at the time. Because I remember as a kid when it came out and I saw it on the big screen, I couldn't not see it because it's Harrison Ford. Just as, as a little sidebar going off the Empire thing, does it make any difference that at the end of Empire, we don't know what's happening to Han Solo? I was so mad at the end of Empire that I don't remember 
space for that piece of rage. I I think I was just so <laughs> mad about the Luke storyline that it didn't really bother me that we had kind of left a dangling participle over there with Ford. So maybe it's my German. I don't mind dangling participles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never thought about it in the context of the other films out at the same sort of time. And yeah, it's yeah. It, like you say, coming right off the back of him being a big star in something, but the, the big rumor of he's not going to appear in it anymore. <laughs> yeah, that that rumor did not hit the teen and preteen girls because we would not have had it. <laughs> we would not have suffered that at all. It was just assumed that he would come back, period. Okay. <laughs> and bend over at least once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steph, did you want to talk to uh, three, your points three and four here? Yeah, I, I do think that in addition to it's being a just a straightforward storyline, it had such a clear definition of good and evil, right? You know, standard Nazis, evildoers, nobody wants them to win ever. So, oh, I, I don't know if that's politics to say, but there you have it. Um, oh, you can say whatever you want to. You're, you're allowed to say that no one wants Nazis to win. That is absolutely okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, you, you never know, given the state of current politics. Um, yeah, true. But... So, um, Did Indy punch any of the Nazis in the face? Uh, Indy punched people, and yes, he punched at least one person in the face at the uniform change after the submarine scene. Um, oh, I, yeah, the guy who dresses him down, yeah. Um, I think he, the others that he punched were parts of larger fight scenes, choreographed fight scenes. So, yes, he was punching Nazis left and right and kicking them and, you know, throwing <laughs> things at them. But um, in terms of just that straightforward one punch, knock them out, that was the uniform change. So I do think that the... The fight scenes, the special effects um, were a draw, at least for me, and part of the commercial success. This was kind of just after Clint Eastwood resurgence of spaghetti westerns and blah, blah. Um, so <laughs> I I was really into those big saloon brawl scenes and the the guy who just doesn't want to have anything of it in, you know one punch to knock the last guy out or brings out a gun into the knife fight or whatever. So I, I think the special effects in the fast paced action, and I say that with a seventies pair of glasses on, I think those were big indicators of the commercial success, at least. I think that's fair. What did you think about the introduction? It kind of had a slow start to some people, but those first few minutes with no dialogue where um, people took people, I, uh, Spielberg actually took, care crafting that scene to bring in the most iconic images of Indiana Jones, right? That's where they were introduced for the first time. And hopefully part, part of the reason they became so iconic, um, because it was so specifically designed by Spielberg to make it so with the hat and the whip. What did you think on that first impression? Well, I certainly didn't mind the intro shot of his rear. I mean, Even though on. he didn't bend over. He doesn't have to bend over. He's Harrison Ford. Right. <laughs> For me, it was just, it was really iconic, I think, because even from the perspective of someone who had never seen it, I'm very familiar with the hat and the whip. I mean, when you think of Indiana Jones, that's what you think of. And so we kept getting those shots of his hat or the whip on his hip. And so even without the dialogue and coming into it, never having seen it, there was no question in my mind that we were watching Indy. I think a new audience in 1981 may have had more wonder at the mystery that Spielberg was creating because they didn't have benefit of decades of icon iconography. Mm -hmm. But I can say I liked it for what it was. I think I've said before, I love a uh, film or anything that comes in where it's a uh, sort of more fully established universe. And the fact you start and he's already on a mission and there's these pre-existing relationships going on. And actually the first quarter is all about his professor or these people who knew him or this class who have, have clearly come to love him over the years. It, it's really nice to enter a film and go, oh, there's a thing going on. And I have to understand it as we go rather than uh, lots of exposition up front. That's cool. I didn't really like him as a professor. I think I liked him more as a professor. Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> You just missed the whole point of the movie. 
Oh, oh I promise you I didn't. <laughs> um, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting about, since we're just quickly talking about the um, professor and the adventurer, um, I thought that with the studied use of shadow and light in the intro image and the whole series of scenes around his first adventure, um, Spielberg used shadow really effectively. Um, and I've, his uh, photographer, his cinematographer is famous for his use of shadow. Um, and I, his name escapes me at the moment. Doug Slocum. That's the guy. Yes. Doug Slocum. <laughs> but the way that it was so dark with just patchy light. And then as a professor, he was on stage and in the light. And so obviously portraying a character that was not the real him, which is probably why you liked him there. (laughs) 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 To me, that was, that was really fascinating. And it's one of the points that remains fascinating when I look at it with a more adult intellectualized view when I look at the film, I can say, huh, the way that they played um, and off played his intellect and his professorship against the adventurer and the guy who's willing to play in the shadows. I thought they did a really good job of doing that with environment rather than obviously stating that he's kind of playing two different roles there. It's definitely two different roles. I, I had a hard time watching the movie kind of reconciling the two Mm-hmm. And understanding how one person can be both of those things because they were so very different from each other. Mm. And I don't know, that was, I, and maybe that's why the professor is in it, you know, for like 30 seconds and then the entire rest of the movie is the adventurer. But that was something that I could not reconcile in my brain. To me, and I think this brings up one of the next things that uh, that we're going to talk about is it. It brings to the fore the question of, is Indiana Jones really a hero? Is he actually a hero? And the fact that he's wearing such an obvious mask as a professor, you know, there there is no re- need to reconcile them because he's obviously, in my mind, when I watch it, he's putting on a mask. This isn't who he is. This is so, someone he plays on TV, right? <laughs> I think he wants to think of himself as a hero, but... Throughout the film, and even as a kid, I recognized throughout the film that he wasn't very brave. He spends most of his time running away from things. And uh, there are points where he seems to face situations even though he's afraid. But this was a time when the real heroes just didn't show fear, pain, softness. You know, you've got Rambo and Schwarzenegger and Clint Eastwood, and it's all about that stiff upper lip and then indiana jones is generally a thief who hid at a university when i was a teen i loved that bad boy aspect um he was bad without being tortured you know he didn't have to be rambo stitching up his own cuts um or completely inhuman like the terminator he was just sitting on the edge of being a winner but never quite got there i think he's an anti-hero in that perspective he gets the crap beat out of him and he shows that he's in pain. It was one of my favorite scenes when he's on the submarine and Marion's trying to gently take care of him. And he's just like, don't touch me because everything hurts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And that's okay for Indiana Jones because we know he's kind of a weenie who runs away from things. When I think, when I look back now and I watch it, there's even though I watched it seven times straight in the last month, there's this <laughs> there's this sidebar running in the back of my mind thinking but he's stealing the property of indigenous peoples all around the world this is so wrong <laughs> um so while he's doing that he's convincing himself that he's a good guy and he's not <laughs> he's a bad guy wearing the mask of a good guy so i think even as a kid i kind of got that that this was a guy who was kind of deluding himself as to who he he thought he was and who he really was. But that was okay because he was such a bad boy doing it. He had a whip. Come on. (laughs) He did have a whip and a great hat. (laughs) Great hat. Uh, You 
you use the term anti-hero to describe him, and I just wanted to kind of define that for everybody because I had to look it up, and then I felt silly because it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> An anti-hero is a protagonist who lacks conventional heroic qualities like idealism, courage, or morality, and I think that describes Indy to a T. Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, a bit of a spectrum. <sighs> The, the famous anti-heroes are people like uh, Patrick Bateman from American Psycho um, or Alex from A Clockwork Orange, who are <laughs> almost, almost villainous, but they are the okay, protagonists. You guys know so. I haven't seen these, right? I, oh, absolutely, I know. For <laughs> okay. the audience, Spoiler who have actually alert. Been worthwhile Don't. watching no, films. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he's not out that far on the spectrum. Um, even uh, Lisbeth Salander from the girl with the dragon tattoo, I think falls in this category, mm-hmm. but he's more in the um, Batman sort of range. Not necessarily a goodie, but still trying to do do things his way. You know, Matthew, I think one of the things that I find different from the standard anti-hero, besides just the intensity, is that a lot of anti-heroes have that shade of evil. Mm. And so I don't even see that as the flavor of anti-hero that Indiana Jones represents so much as just that ineffectual sad sack, right? (laughs) He's, he's out there and he's trying and he has this image of who he is and who he wants to be. He's just not very good at it. And I don't know, as a coming of age person that resonated with me because I tried to be good at everything and I really wasn't that great. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you know, to watch this guy convince himself he's a hero, try really hard to be a hero, and let's face it, not do such a great job. (laughs) We'll talk more about specifics (laughs) as we go through here. But that's part of what made the movie good to me. I think I agree with you that that he doesn't have that evil bent. You know, I, I don't see any evil in Indy at all, even though I will continue to say I think he's a really terrible human being, but I don't think really terrible human beings have to necessarily be evil. Mm -hmm. I think they can just be mean or unthoughtful Mm -hmm. and, you know, disregarding of other human life. Selfish is the word I'm looking for, you know, Mm -hmm. and and that's what I see in Indy. I I don't see evil. Preach it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I really like the professor scene because um, it ties to the scene at the end where he's threatening to blow up the arc with a rocket launcher. And it's it's basically informing us that he does at least know what he's talking about and have some respect for the artifacts. Hmm. He's not necessarily doing it because he wants to rob and and make money from it. There's there's something about the history of it that he likes, even if he's going to these uh, very well hidden, very very, uh, trap ridden places to try and take the antiquities away. Yeah, he, he at good. least knows what they are. He's just not a. He's not just a, a tomb raider. He's a well-educated thief. <laughs> <laughs> he is, and and one of the things I noticed, if if you look in my thoughts doc that that I will link to in the show notes, is I was slightly impressed at how concerned he was with the museum getting the artifacts, because while he is getting paid for it, he really wanted to make sure that they were safe and that the museum got them and to me this is extra textural i'm just reading into that but to me i interpret that as this archaeologist this lover of antiquities is trying to preserve those antiquities and i did enjoy that aspect of him but that's such a small part of his character in this movie yeah i agree i also think he was ineffectual fulfilling it and again that just makes him lovable speaking of andy being lovable Steph, what is there in this film that you think supports so many other stories? Well, you know, if you take him on just a surface hat and whip level, men want to be him and women want to love him. You know, how hard did those movie makers work to make Indiana Jones appear to be a highly desirable man's man? When I was 13 years old, I could not help but notice This man was handsome, apparently in charge, intelligent, well-educated, and willing to get dirty. And he had a whip. I don't know. It it worked for me. 
Um, <laughs> so, Steph, Steph, you keep mentioning the whip. <laughs> he had a big whip and he could whip it out and extend it all the way. I knew just enough to know that that was a little naughty. So um, <laughs> then, you know, one of the first, another iconic scene, there were so many iconic scenes in this. Kudos to Spielberg and his team. A fat snake crawls up from his crotch, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Oh, this is God. just, I mean, when I was 13 years old, I thought, come on, that's just too obvious. Um, then you have this beautiful young college girl, right, who's so enamored of this professor, and she hasn't even seen him with the hat, that she wrote, <laughs> oh, the whip. that's a fair point. <laughs> I, I left the whip out just for you, Matthew. <laughs> um, but she's so enamored of him that she took the time to write I love you in the mirror on her eyelids just for that class. Young women wanted to love somebody that much. You know, young girls are thinking, wow, that's so romantic. I wonder if I could do that. I don't know if modern young girls did that. But my friends and I chatted about that, you know, behind our hands where nobody would know that we were that mortifyingly engrossed in this. Um, <laughs> So an interesting thing about that scene, I noticed when I rewatched it last night, um, as the camera is panning across the students in the class, all of the girls are sitting in the front half of the class. The boys mm -hmm. are in the back. Mm -hmm. The boys all look bored and kind of unaffected. And every single girl is leaning forward in her chair. Her chin is propped up on her hand and she's got her head cocked to the side and she's just got those dreamy eyes as they yeah, puppy as dog eyes. at, at, <laughs> uh, at Indy. Every single one across. And then we cut to the girl with I love you written on her eyelids. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, the first time I saw this, I was just like, I that suspension of disbelief that you have when you watch this movie because you love it so much mm -hmm. dropped me right out at this point. I was just like, yeah. this is so ridiculous. It's terrible. But still yeah. interesting. You know, I think you're right. It was it was done on purpose. And it it was to kind of show exactly what you said. Men want to be him and women want to love him. I think that is perfect. Yeah. I do think that there are very few women in this movie. But other than Sala's wife, who was already claimed, they all loved Indy. Well, Marion didn't love Indy at first. Oh, she did. Oh, oh no. From before the story this film even started she was madly hotly passionately in love with him he was the one who got away oh right i i know that but when he walked back into the bar her instinct is to hit him and fight him so i Four think play. that's a little bit of that <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll just stop talking now sorry the, the no thing... no you're 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 not wrong <laughs> The scene I'd never really uh, taken in until watching it this time is, uh, like you say, when, when he shows up and she sees him and they, they start having this argument. And I think I kind of zone out as, oh, yeah, they have an argument and then perhaps things up and they're going to fall in love by the end. The actual dialogue, she says to him, I was a child. He says you knew what, what you were doing. She tells him I was, in I was in love. It was wrong and you knew it. Mm -hmm. And then we've also got this scene earlier of all these young girls at college being in love with him. And it's... Mm -hmm. I'd never picked up on it, you know, watching it as a younger person. And now it's like, oh, that's just a little seedy. That's more than a little seedy. That's quite illegal. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. professors aren't supposed to have affairs with their students. And you get the sense that even though her father was the, the professor role, he was an older grad student, let's assume. That's what I always assumed and mm. took advantage of her teenage affair, you know, her teenage crush. So, yeah, not a good guy. But so when you're a teenager yourself and you think this handsome adventurer could possibly be interested in you, even though you're not quite old enough, you know, hey, it it sells movies. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about Marion's age because, I mean, she would have been 15 when they were involved and he was a grown man teaching college already. And I think that's just... Creepy and illegal. I, that's just yucky. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. yucky. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't that, like it. I think we're supposed to whistle past it, uh, but it's not very easy to do. Right. I think we're supposed to think it's romantic, honestly. I think that's the, the way that they set it up. 
that he was her first love and now he's come back into her life and then they go through all this adventure together and they waltz off into the sunset happily ever after and when you don't really think about it you're just like oh it's so cute and she's back with the man that she loves and it's great Mm. but it's kind of gross and i think that in the context of the 70s there was not the level of awareness in how gross that was not even for the young girls who were of that age Oh, I would never expect it to be so. gross for the 15-year-olds because the 15-year-olds are the ones who are looking at Harrison Ford going, oh, he's so dreamy. Mm-hmm. He's not too old for me. <laughs> right? It, exactly. Yeah, I mean, 15, exactly. 15-year-olds are not, oh, I could get in trouble for saying this, but, but 15-year-olds just don't have the self-awareness enough to know that something's inappropriate. It just yeah. seems oh, the world romantic experience. and exotic mm-hmm. and, and great, you know? And let's face it, romance of that intensity is scary the first time you fall in love. So having somebody with a little more experience and, you know, been out in the world with his hat and whip is a little, it's kind of confidence building, right? I don't have to worry about those details. This hero or in anti-hero is going to come in and whisk me off my feet and then I don't have to worry about it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think there was definitely that it was a conscious kind of um, influence that that went on that lent itself to especially young women really wanting to love him. And then you add on to it that he's never very successful and he gets bumps and bruises and you can kiss his boo-boos better. You know, it was it was a lot to handle. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the puppy dog face he makes when he's pointing to different bits of him she can kiss. Right? <laughs> so funny. He has a terrific puppy face, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Those eyes. <laughs> and, and I think this is probably a good place to say, you can criticise something you love. We can point out yes. flaws or problem things and still enjoy the material. Um, and watch it seven times. You guys can. <laughs> In, in general, though, I think, you know, we've used the phrase, Mandy, about whistling past things and, and being able to, to live with it. Yes, there, yeah. there are there are sometimes problematic things with the things you love. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, now would be a good time for me to point out Buffy and Spike, right? <laughs> uh, I had to get that in best, somewhere. <laughs> the second best romance in that series. First being Willow and Tara. Absolutely. Hello. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. I had to get that Buffy reference in there. You know, I fulfilled my challenge, Matthew. I was you said to talk about Star Trek. Come on. <laughs> hey, I mentioned it like five times in the intro. <laughs> doesn't count. It was not contextual. True, but that doesn't count. <laughs> we'll we'll <Fine>. wait. <laughs> Accept it then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Steph, do you want to talk about the texture of the film? I know we kind of, well, you kind of already talked about shadows and stuff. Uh, do you want to expand on that or do you want to just move on to the pace? We can just move on to the pace. I think, like I said, the shadows were powerful. And I think some their use of shadow outside of black and white was um, not common at that point. So texturally, it, it lent interest in a bright... Can I just say I hated it? <laughs> okay, yes, of course you can. <laughs> I liked it at first, the first time it was used, because I thought it was really cool, but he did it so many times over the course Mm -hmm. of the movie that it just got tiresome and I I didn't appreciate it anymore. Yeah. I I enjoyed it throughout. And I thought the other thing that they did really well, in my opinion, throughout was the, the earthiness, the grittiness, you know, they filmed in sand and they made it dusty and yellow and clinging. The light clung and the, dust was in the air the and whole, then they the dressed Marion in white yeah I know oh my gosh <laughs> sorry I know we were going to talk about that later yeah. but it's just, that's all I can think about when you're talking that's, about how dirty yeah. everything was but then they put Marion yeah. in white everything she wore was white and we can talk Except about that in more pants. detail down the road yeah, so, yeah. Oh God. yeah that one's a tough one for me to what, what do you call it Whistle pass. Whistle pass. Yeah, whistle yeah. pass. And that one's tough for me to whistle past, even when I watch it now as an adult and know that I'm watching for the purpose of nostalgia. It still drops me out. You mentioned talking about the pace of the film. 
when I, in the eighties, when I was watching this, it was super fast paced. The special effects came one after the other. And I wonder from kids, y'all, y'all kids, um, <laughs> how do you all think it holds you up? Young people. <laughs> right. Exactly. How do you think it holds up given the fast pace of pop and every other culture these days? I think it actually holds up pretty well overall. Uh, the only piece that didn't for me was the, the ghosts and the melting faces at the end. But everything else, I thought, I wouldn't be surprised to see it in a movie today. Hmm. That surprises me, actually, especially like the the ballroom, the ballroom, bar room fight scene. It seemed so fast and funny when I was a kid watching it. And nowadays, having seen, you know, all of the Marvel adventure movies where the fight scenes have so much CGI and the super fast paced that they can achieve. It seemed a little slower to me. To be fair, it might just be because I've been watching a lot of really old movies lately. <laughs> so maybe my point of comparison is not quite so great. Um, I, I, that out there. I think as a point of comparison, Lord of the Rings is a good comparison to this. Well, what's a better word for that? <laughs> mm-hmm. is, a, is a good thing to compare this to, though, because... Lord of the Rings also has these very uh, physical fights in contained spaces that have a lot going on at once, but the camera moves amongst them, uh, again, with this same level of humour. Mm-hmm. I think absolutely the, the whole film actually would stand up pretty well at the moment. Cool. Which I think, given the fact that you know, they've made several Mummy movies, there's a new Mummy movie coming out, they're still making Indiana Jones films and other films of this type. Yeah, this is this is very much the template, and... As with a lot of things like this, it was done very, very well. Yeah. I want to throw out there complete sidebar, but you brought up the other Indiana Jones movies and we've, uh, you've mentioned it through here. I didn't like any of them. I think it's hard to mess up when you throw Sean Connery into a film. So that one didn't annoy me as much, but I just, (laughs) this was the only one that I enjoyed of the series that I watch over and over again. Just sidebar. Okay. I am mouth agape. Really? (laughs) (laughs) Does that surprise you? The the third film is one of the great action adventure films. I I would put it up there with Jurassic Park and the Avengers. Now, see, I I enjoyed it, but not as much as the first one. I was older when I watched it, and that may be why. Because the first one is so viscerally nostalgic for me. Yes, I can. I can completely understand that. I want to make the joke about the fourth one, like, oh, how can you not love it? I can't even make the joke though. Right. <laughs> it's occurring in my head, but I just know how ridiculous that sounds. Saying it. Uh, I was glad they got the original male and female leads back, though. Sometimes they, when they make those kinds of things, they substitute. I was really glad they didn't. Yes, true. So. But that was about they... the only thing I liked okay. about it. <laughs> that and the yeah. fact that he took the hat back at the end. His adventures are not over. And now we live in a fear of a next one. Um, mm. so, but the pace, I thought, you know, I loved it. And because this is this is so comfortable a film for me to watch, um, having seen it so often and for so many years, the pace is just right for the movie. Um, I think the way they use music in the movie lends itself to that it is alternately sweeping and driving and the music absolutely controlled my mood through the whole film it grabs me by the gut every time indy's theme comes on dun, 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 dun. i'm like yes <laughs> <laughs> i want to dun, 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 dun. um <laughs> it's um one of my favorite feelings when i'm watching the film is hearing those tones and that rush of adrenaline that comes into my body watching the movie because of that theme. Did you all have any experience to the movie music along those lines? I just want to share something that I tweeted last night, okay? Mm -hmm. So I had been complaining that I was watching a movie that I hated, but I was doing it because (laughs) everybody deserves me to, you know, be my best in these conversations. And so then I tweeted, I can say this much. Even when it's a movie I basically hate, it's still worth it to hear John Williams. Mm-hmm. The only music that I really ever 
pick up on or remember in this movie, of course, is Indy's theme because it's so iconic. It's a wonderful piece of music. And you're absolutely right. When you hear it, it pumps you up and you think, oh, somebody's coming to save the day and it's wonderful and it's great. But that's not who Indy is. And so, you know, it's... <laughs> but he tries. It doesn't he fit tries the character. So much. It just... It, it just, it doesn't fit Indy. And, and that's, I think that's what bothers me about it is, mm-hmm. is Indy's theme should be the theme of a character that's coming to save the day, not somebody who's irrelevant to the story. Ooh, Big Bang Theory reference. <laughs> yes. You know, this movie is not Indiana Jones' story. He just happens to be the person that we're watching it through the lens of. And I, I think we were going to bring that up a little bit later, or we can talk about it now if, if you want to, but. Either way. You know. And Indy's theme should not be Indy's theme, is how I feel about that. Well, I think that's a very well and firmly stated opinion, Amanda. (laughs) (laughs) She she said condescendingly. (laughs) I did have a little bit of my English teacher voice on there, didn't I? (laughs) Um. It, it's really hard. You you made the note about the music before I watched it, so I went, oh, I, I, I'm actually quite interested because I can't think of the music from it. Like you say, the theme is so um, uh, so iconic, uh, and it really is. So it's really hard to watch it and go, how would this feel watching it for the first time? Because it is just one of the John Williams scores. It's one of the great soundtracks, and it's it it absolutely works brilliantly when he rides the horse into the car chase mm. and, and the, the, those notes go off. You're like, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be a heroic moment. Uh, much like the, the James Bond theme does the same, you know, mm. da, 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 and you know something's happening. You know, the, the Aston Martin taking off. But he never saves the day. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but he tries so hard and he gets little boo-boos that need kissy better. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> it, it reminds me of there was a uh, an old film called Triple, not an old film, ten fifteen years ago now called Triple X, uh, starring Vin yes. Diesel, which was trying to be a kind of more action um, James Bond, but with some of this same stuff going on, and it had some of those same moments, but no iconic theme to it, and it's really strange. It, it stands out how you, the music does play such a big part, so it really works. But in paying attention to the music, the thing that really stood out for me was. Wow, he just ripped off his own Star Wars store, score, didn't he? Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, it, you know, the music would start and just three or four notes, you know, half a bar, and I'd go, oh, it's Han and Leia's theme, or it's the, <laughs> the Escape of the Death Star or something. And then it goes somewhere different, but every time it just puts me in those those uh, that, that mindset that that's what's going on. Yeah, I can totally see that. That might be part of the reason that I love the music score so much in this movie, because it was part of the other films that I loved. So um, Yeah, when, when you've got one that trick he, that is that good, right. keep doing that trick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that the subtler moments in the score, when they're, the music is building, helping to build the tension in his conversation in the bar with Belloc, it's muted. It's not a big piece of what you experience in that moment, but it's there and it's still got that little bit of driving rhythm that you know something's going to happen. You're on the edge because you know all those Arabs have already been bought off. And mm. so, I mean, the music was really part of what keeps me engaged. And I'll be honest, as often as I have seen this, I occasionally doze off because I'm familiar. <laughs> and the music is part of the reason why, because there are those long sweeping moments in the score where it's just rhythmic and familiar and comfortable to me. Not quite as rhythmic and familiar as the score to Speed, which is another one where the, the music of the film is part of what makes the film so wonderful to me. But um, but definitely oh. drives the the mood of the movie. Yeah, when I think of speed, I certainly don't think of the music. Really? Yeah, I could not tell you anything about the music of that. Oh my I gosh! Could... That's fascinating. Mandy, have you seen Speed? <laughs> I have seen Speed. I've seen oh. it many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, but you don't... Oh, wow. You've seen it many times because it was written by Joss Whedon. <laughs> was it? I did not know that. Uh, he was uncredited, wasn't he? Yeah, he did lots of uh, dialogue work. Yeah. Uh, Joss. I, I did not know who Joss Whedon was back then, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
He gets me every time. Sometimes I don't even know it. Go figure. But mm. yeah, the music. I loved the music in in the um in the whole movie and especially Indy's theme. And I can agree with you a little bit, Amanda, where the the music doesn't meet, match the man, but I think it matches the story. And since the story is really the story he's trying to tell himself, I think in that way it matches the man. It matches the man who he thinks he is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can agree. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You all had uh, talked, I guess it's part of your standard reviews. I've only listened to two of your podcasts, so you'd think. You'd think I'd see the pattern by now um, of the awards that the movie has won. And one of the things that that we talked about a little bit was the the hat and the whip. And so the a little bit, a little bit, right? (laughs) The wardrobe designer, I have no idea if I'm saying this right, Deborah Noodleman Landis, she develops a lot of these iconic wardrobe looks for impact and they just last in our culture um in our cultural awareness but she wasn't even put up for any awards for this and so the fact that it has remained so iconic for so many years and that you know spoofs and non-spoofs have all drawn from that hat and whip combination look and she never really got the kudos for this that kind of irks me you know she deserved so much more you know here's all of the the awards that the film did get and was music one of those i'm trying to look back and see yeah both sound and uh, sound effects editing at one yeah so you know you have all of this great music that nobody remembers except for the indie theme right and then you have this great wardrobe that everybody remembers that didn't even get nominated for an award. To be fair, though, she did not design that wardrobe. Jim Steranko, a comic book artist, did the original concept art for Indy. I didn't know that. At George Lucas's urging. And so if you, if you go and look at those original drawings, they are exactly what we got. So I think Landis... She took that concept and she brought it to life and she did it beautifully, but she didn't design it. And that may have to do with why uh, she didn't get nominated for the award. And what was that lady's name again? Uh, his name was Jim hey, oops. <laughs> uh, Steranko. Jim I don't know Steranko. if I'm saying that right. It's S S T E R A N K O. Huh. I wrote his name down to look him up because I did not know that. All I, as deep as I went, was just who put the hat and whip together and why doesn't anybody know? Why did she win the awards for it? Right. So that actually makes sense to me if she didn't have the original concept all the way through to completion. Okay. I feel better now. Thanks. You're welcome. So we already kind of talked about the next section in the doc um, with the professor versus the adventurer guy. So why don't we skip to your favorite moments? Of course we can skip to my favorite moments. So, I have so many would it favorite be fair moments. To just say the whole movie. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know that it would be fair to say the whole movie. I think there might be like five percent that I didn't think of as a favorite moment. But, but, but there when was he wasn't carrying a whip, <laughs> right? I don't. Was he ever not carrying his whip? I don't think so. I think it stays right there on his hip at all times, ready to be whipped out. Um, as Except a good when man's man should. Mode. See, no wonder I don't like him as a professor. <laughs> um, so, um, I will I will share some of my favorite images, though images from the movie that when I think about them, I find myself replicating them. Right. So I'm sitting here. You can't see me because it's a podcast and not a video cast. Thank you, Jesus. Um, oh, can I say Jesus? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, you can. But now you have to reference all the other prophets. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, Mary and Jehoshaphat. Um, (laughs) So when in one of the first scenes, when they're in the tunnel and they're after the idol, the golden idol in South America, and Indy's Latino guide is standing behind him, safely behind the last of the booby traps, and Indy's at the idol just rubbing his fingers together. How am I going to get this bag onto the idol's platform? And the Latino guide is doing the same thing. 
I'm doing the same thing. Like I'm sitting there, I'm rubbing my fingers with them. Like, okay, we can do it. We can do it. Great way to draw somebody, an audience in is to show me that there's an audience already established who's right there with Indy, right? I love that moment. And then you quickly get to, Jake, start the plane. Just running away. You can't. I have yeah, to get out of here. Jake and... was not the brightest <laughs> crayon in the box. I mean, really, he's just sitting there fishing and Indy is running at him with arrows being shot at him, screaming, and he's just like, what? Yeah, should we talk about the homoerotic moment when Jake talks about his snake crawling up between Indy's legs? Let's not. Okay. It, it sounds like you want out. to, but, but I think we've covered it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I liked a lot of the scenes that had Marion in them. Um, and we were slated to talk about my mixed feelings about the Marion character as it was written into the story later. But she has this moment in the bar fight when she's in the midst of this bar fight. People are shooting and fighting and somebody shoots a hole through a whiskey barrel and she sees it dripping and doesn't want to waste it. Of course, she's the bar owner. So she takes a couple swigs from this fountaining whiskey out of the busted barrel. I'm thinking, you know, she's going to use it as a flamethrower. No, she just wanted a drink. I love that moment. Yeah, I thought, I totally thought she was going to do it as a flamethrower because she had just picked up the torch too. And so I was like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. And then she just drinks it to drink it. I lost my train of thought, but I have it right here in front of me. When Indy grabs his stomach in that bar scene and he isn't shot, I thought that was cool. Uh, you know, he totally expected to be shot when he heard that gunshot. Even though they tell you you never hear the shot that kills you, he expected it to be his stomach, but it wasn't. She had shot the bad guy. A very exciting moment with Marion was she does a lot of her acting in this uh, particular role at the top of her voice. When the bar is burning behind Marion and she tells Indy at top volume, I'm your bleep bleep partner. So I thought that was very exciting and engaging. And I expected her, therefore, to be a co-hero with Indy throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah, you would think so. I mean, they did a really good job of setting up Marion's character with the bar fight and then this scene with Indy. And then it just falls so flat. It was very ineffectual as Indy's character throughout. So, theme. I'm sensing a theme. I actually liked the the red line across the maps that they used to show travel because there were so many different locations in this movie. I liked the clarity of the airplane puttering across with a little red line showing where they were going next. Did you like that, Mandy? Was that something that dropped you out of the story? No, I just didn't really think about it one way or the other. No, I... At the time, it was really controversial. Do people, you know, some people hated it, some people loved it. I, I like it because it evokes that idea of the sort of classic uh, cinema uh, short stories that George Lucas liked to copy for this and for Star Wars. Exactly. There's that iconic scene, which nobody can not mention, I don't think, in their favorite moments, when they have the big uh, fight in the Arabic bazaar and he's facing the huge fighter with the big swords coming at him and he just shakes his head and like pulls out his gun and shoots him dead. I love that. I actually I really like that this. scene. I think that's my favorite scene in the whole movie just because I was so surprised by it because that's not what's supposed to happen. And it was, it subverted my expectation of what a hero would do, even though Andy's clearly not a hero. Mm hmm. And it turns out that's not how it was scripted. That's not how it was supposed to be. They were on like take some absurd take, like 37 or something. You know, Harrison Ford and most of the crew was sick at this point. They had all had dysentery and he was just tired of doing it. So instead of doing the fight, he just turned around and shot him. And they decided to keep that as the scene in the film. And I, I love it. And they used that in other films as well. So although it was a prequel, they used it in uh, Temple of Doom when they had a fighter come up over the hill and he pulled the gun and shot him. And then the next thing you know is a whole wave of fighters and he has to run away anyway. So it was such an effective ad lib that they carried it through the rest of the series. I thought that was interesting, too. If it works, reuse it. Definitely. I was kind of sad 
when they in the bad dates scene when the monkey died but i thought the line was classic you know very calmly just grabs the poison date out of the air before indy can catch it in his mouth and says bad dates that was cool i was sad the monkey died even though he was a little shit traitor monkey (laughs) yeah um it i i think it was a she but yeah she was um she was not a traitor to uh her human she was very loving and supportive of her human and his choices so Uh for a monkey she was doing the right thing Uh (laughs) uh-huh just saying (laughs) Um, Is that your head cannon for the for the monkey? <laughs> so, um, another of my favorite scenes was the the hanger scene. Um, not hanger like airplane hanger, but hanger like coat hanger. It was one of those totally mm. unexpected moments again, where you know Marion has been captured and she is tied up on the floor of the um, tent and just been released by Belloc and. In comes the guy who had been willing to torture her before in her own bar, and he pulls out this tri-broken bar that's connected by chains, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to witness a beating. Help her, Indy! And he flips it around, and it's a coat hanger. (laughs) I just, like, and everybody in the scene... Marion and Bellock included and everybody in the theater where I was watching it for the first time all heaved this huge sigh of relief you know <laughs> like, and to this day I see that and I I do a little more giggle than sigh of relief but there's always that frisson of relief when oh phew she's not gonna get beat phew <laughs> I thought that was a great scene a fun fact about that is that Spielberg had intended to use that same gag in his earlier movie, 1941, but he ended up cutting it because test audiences didn't think it was funny, and he was convinced that it was funny, so he put it in uh, Raiders. And he gets to say, I told you so, because it was funny. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. I do agree that it was funny. Matthew, do you have any favorite moments from this movie? There's no moments that I'd point to. But it's kind of anything with Salah. Mm. John Rhys Davis is wonderful in this because he's he's kind of he he is Indiana, but he's settled down and and given up the the adventure seeking ways. Um, but he's very charming. He's very interesting. He's clearly very capable. And like you say, with the bad date scene and others, he's really funny. Yeah. When, when they're looking at the the well of souls, he goes, "Asps very dangerous. You go first. <laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> Oh, my favorite's when they actually um, pull the slab off the Well of Souls, and the first thing he sees is this stone dragon, and yes. he, like, screams <laughs> and covers his face. I love yeah. it. I think it's hilarious. And then he just kind of comes back sheepishly, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that is funny. Like, I actually I'm- like Sala better than, than Indy in this movie. I was actually going to say, I hadn't... I hadn't filled in that backstory for him, Matthew, but I can see where where that is, like, kind of his backstory. You can kind of see those hints of it. And I think if he if they had told his story, it would be better adventure because he would really be that adventurer with a good heart. And you know what I mean? He's a stand-up guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, jo- John Miss Davies. Send him he- Indy into the snakes first, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, John Rhys Davies does, does a, a remarkable job in this. He has something of an accent, but it's just a foreign accent. Like, I wouldn't look at it, hear him say it and go, "Oh, he's clearly Egyptian." Um, he's he's in a, an old series called Shogun, where he plays a Spaniard with the same accent, effectively, um, and he does kind <laughs> well, he of the mostly same. Plays Gimli with the same accent, doesn't? Well, he? exactly. It's the same as Gimli. It's kind of the same as Treebeard, um, and he's even in Star Trek Voyager as Leonardo da Vinci. And he's got yeah. basically the same accent as an Italian. You I did it. Just the way that he talks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you did, it. you did it, nephew. Yay! <laughs> oh, we win. <laughs> okay. 
quite good because he, 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 I mean, genuinely, he is my favorite thing about this film. Uh, and particularly his ending, she gives him a kiss and he just goes off singing HMS Pinnacle. I love Pinnacle, that part. Which That's is my always thing. funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mandy, do you have any uh, favorite moments? I think I With, mentioned the, the whip and really his rear. Liked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so three, his rear in the beginning with the with the whip on his hip. Um, when he shoots the swordsman instead of actually fighting him, he's just like, "I don't have time for this," and shoots him. And then when Sala screams from the dragon, I think those are those are the only moments that I actually like in this movie. Did you have any moments that? Uh, well, you've actually mentioned a number of them, but any that really stand out that dropped you out of the film? All of them except for those three. Wow. Uh, see, even as, as favorite as this film is for me, there are moments in the film that really do drop me out of the story. Mm. And so the the staff itself, the mathematics of the staff don't work with the cinematography, the actual prop that they used, because they talk about six kadam being 72 inches. Well, that's six feet less one kadam, which would make it five feet. But then Harrison Ford is six foot one and the staff is taller than he when they drop him into the well of souls. And that just doesn't work for me. Never did. And that, wait, that's too tall. He's tall. That doesn't work. So maybe I'm a nerd to do the math while I watch the movie, but I can't help myself. And it just drops me out every time. The other thing is that the, um, the well of souls, when they're in there and they open up the arc and the whole thing is glowing from within and neither Indy nor Sala seem to notice or comment on the fact that, you know, oh, we have light now and it's from this interior source. <laughs> like, it shouldn't they at least get something's <laughs> off there? I think I had canon that, that it was just the gold was so bright that it seemed to be glowing. You know, I, I mean, that's that's the only way that i can try to be accepting of that yeah doesn't work for you no <laughs> I, I think i'd accept it more if the idol at the beginning had had something mystical to it if this was just what mystical items did mm. okay but the fact that it's this one that is so you know deeply rooted in old testament mythology well but i mean it did turn out to actually be kind of mystic Mm. supernatural you know i mean it, well, it did have power so i grew up in a very fire and brimstone kind of religious education and the stories that i learned about the art growing up was that no one but a levite could touch even the carrier poles of the ark or they would mm -hmm. be burned by the wrath of god so the whole time they're carrying around the ark i'm thinking yeah yeah blah blah <laughs> <laughs> you know, if this were really Wrath of God, you'd know it already. You know, the end scene kind of made that a little better for me because he took a while, but God noticed that kind of thing. Um, you can take out the God talk from the if you need to. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the whole arc story, I had to let go of that in order to enjoy the movie because that was not the stories that I had heard growing up. I had to also let go of a lot of my feminism when I when I watch this movie as an adult because I am an avowed mm. feminist and you know thus we get into the discussion of Marion yes so first question why do they always put female captives in dresses why OMG yep yeah. <laughs> there are no reasons it's speechless <laughs> and, and even more than speechless it just made me mad and even as a, a kid and I'm a, I was a, already a tomboy when Marion put on the dress in the desert tent and you know sure she's trying to outthink him and make him think she's going along but it did it have to be a pretty dress with no bra and heels you know white heels white dress uh and peak toes in a desert that makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> i'm just saying well white dresses in the desert don't make sense either so so yeah if we're talking about moments that pull me out of the film, um, yeah, he gives her the dress and she puts it on and, and we, we see very clearly he's watching her in the mirror. Just mm. why film? Why do you need to do that? And they're doing that so that we can see her and it's got a bit of sexy sexiness to it. And then not long after that, she's thrown into the well of souls. 
and you have this gratuitous upshot sweeping camera moment. It's like, uh, we don't need to see up the dress, guys. It's fine. <laughs> it really is okay. <laughs> I did like the peak toe when they used it for the snake. I thought maybe that's the reason they put the peak toe shoe in there to begin with, because they planned the snake scene to show the snake going through the toe of the shoe. It had a dramatic uh, effect. It's not worth it. Exactly. Why? And you kind of touched on this a little bit, but why do you think Marion chose to put on the dress? I think I skipped past that the first time I watched it. And that really stood out to me last night when I rewatched the parts that I rewatched is she didn't put up a fight about that dress at all. Like, first she kind of scoffed at it, but then she was like, okay, I'll go put it on. And then she takes the dress and goes and puts it on. She tells and us. And I why. couldn't quite understand. I didn't get it. She says, oh, it's pretty. So my first take on it was it's pretty, and even though she's a tough guy because her father died and left her in this uh, Nepalese bar, she's had to be tough her whole life, but she really just wants to be a pretty girl in a pretty dress. Right. That was when I was a kid. That was my understanding of it. And as I've watched it getting on and on in age and getting on and on and on in age, um, <laughs> I I can see that maybe she just felt like being pretty for Belloc would make him more susceptible to her drinking him under the table so she could escape. Like I it gave her that little bit of a benefit of the doubt. But it it's so out of context and out of character in my opinion. Okay, but I can't give her any benefit of the doubt when as soon as Tot comes into the tent and he grabs her by the hand, she pulls away, she runs and cowers behind Belloc, the man who is actually physically holding her captive. She holds his hand and cowers behind him. And so at that point, I'm just done. I can't do anything else with this character. Yes, I agree. Although... I can't say I can't do anything else with this character because I still adore her character. <laughs> I'm willing to forgive her because there were so few women of true strength at the time that even though it was sporadic strength that she showed throughout the movie, it was still worth having a character like that. I think the way she plays it is very nice that she puts it on and goes into this sort of demure mold. And it- for memory, she tells him to send the guard away. You know, you're not going to need to guard me now. So she's kind of got this escape plan going, and you can see her adapting it as she goes of spilling the thing and putting her clothes over the knife so she can grab it later and so on. And it, it almost works, except for the guy with the, the cunning coat turns up. <laughs> that and the unexpected family label liquor, you know. So. Yes. Yeah. Why aren't you passing out? Let's talk a little bit about the women in refrigerators trope when it comes to Marion. Comic writer Gail Simone coined the phrase women in refrigerators after an issue of Green Lantern portrayed the title character coming home to find his girlfriend had been killed and stuffed in the refrigerator. Realizing that sort of thing happens a lot, she started a list of female characters who had been maimed, killed, or depowered solely in order to move the male's plot forward. And, and it's an absolutely valid point. Uh, the way this is done, particularly in comic books, but in fiction in general. Um, Steph, you said that there weren't many yeah, strong, positive women at the time in film. We're kind of still there now. Um, you know, We're still waiting for our first superhero, female superhero-led film. When, when I was thinking about anti-her- uh, anti-heroes earlier, I tried to think of anti-heroines, and even that's not a, that easy. Yeah, I thought Girl in the Dragon Tattoo was a nice example of the few and far between variety. Yeah, in literature it's a bit easier, but... <laughs> I had not heard about the um, women in refrigerators trope, um, Mandy, until you mentioned it in your notes and I was reviewing them in preparation for the for the podcast. And when I when I looked it up and I read about that and some other tropes that had been identified in um, Gail Simone's series, I thought that Marion was more damseled than fridged because I didn't see her as ever actually killed or disabled, but constantly kidnapped. And when she was kidnapped, she really did kind of wait for him to rescue her. And then we're, well, I don't know about anybody else, but when I was watching the rest of the film, waiting for that next time she's kidnapped and she'll wait for him to rescue her. And, you know, so there were times that she attempted to establish her own rescue or her own power, but 
the story never really allowed her to do that. It was always waiting for Indy to rescue her. And he just never showed that much interest in actually rescuing her, which Mm. put, put in fury and rage, even as a child, when I was watching this, that, Oh no, he didn't just retie her in that tent. Oh no, he didn't (laughs) just put that gun down and let her still be held captive and now be captive himself. And, you know, just the, the ways that he gave up in the storyline If you're going to have this trope of kidnap the damsel, have the hero rescue the damsel who's now in distress, then at least follow it through and have him rescue her, right? (laughs) Not choose archaeology consistently, this intellectual exercise Mm. over the physicality of this human being whom he professes to care for. Mm. So even as a child, I thought that was not fair. I may be wrong, and you guys all know that my memory tends to be awful whenever I want things to be one way. (laughs) I tend to remember them in that way. Um, But isn't the only reason that Indy ended up on the submarine at the end was because of Marion? Yes. I I don't know that he would have, you know, jumped on and held on to that submarine if they hadn't kidnapped her. Well, so in, in that instance, he did actually, I mean, he was motivated by what had just happened to Marion. And so, you know, I spent a whole afternoon debating this on Twitter (laughs) because I was trying to understand the difference between being damseled and being fridged. And the general consensus from everybody that I talked to is, like you said, that Marion was a damsel. But I'm still torn and see it as fringing, fridging because her death, while fake, and subsequent kidnappings did actually happen solely to motivate Indy to end up where they ended up. Yeah, the, the death itself is ridiculous. Why do they put a basket that doesn't have her on it in this van that's trying to escape? But the death doesn't motivate him to do anything different. It's not like he goes out. Uh, there's a brief scene of him seeking vengeance, but he still then considered continues the crusade he was already on. And then, yeah, absolutely, from that point, she's damseled. I, I think it's implied that more goes on in the night than we see when he goes to sleep. Because she wakes up and she has no clothes on. Um, I did not see the whip in him with bed, so I imagine they hid it for a reason. Um, <laughs> I I think that when you're talking about the submarine, Mandy, my sense was that it was serendipitous that Belloc, who at that time, at that point in time, controlled the Ark, was on the same submarine that Marion was on. At that point, he did not need to choose. And to me, if he had had to choose at that moment, I don't know, would he have followed Marion or would he have followed the Ark? I think every other choice that he made, his character made throughout the movie, was to choose this archaeological interest over his care about Marion. Yeah. So I think it was just serendipity. Now, all of this said about the damsel and I'm a feminist and here's my guilty admission. I have this deep-rooted sense of romantic protection and savior coming to get me. I loved those moments when Indy did look as though he was actually putting Marion ahead of everything else. The damsel trope, it's a tough one for me to overcome. I'm fairly intelligent, I'm fairly independent, but it would just be so much easier if somebody would save me and take care of me happily ever after. You know, there's that little niggle in the back that says, take me away. Oh, I agree with you, but it's not Indy that I want to take me away. So, (laughs) (laughs) right. Even with the big whip. (laughs) Even with the big whip. Not Indy. Sorry. (laughs) Well, how did, what did you think about the ending? You know, given all of this back and forth with Marion and back and forth with does he have the arc? Does he not have the arc? How did you feel about the way they ended the story? I, I'm i really glad that, that he didn't end up profiting from all of this because that just would have been horrible. And I guess that does make the ending a good one for me just because it ended up not being horrible, if that makes sense. Yeah. I did not like the ending. Even as a kid, I hated the ending. For two reasons. For two reasons, I hated the ending. I thought they should have ended it at the island. You know, 
let it be this happy savior ending. Show them triumphantly delivering the Ark to the United States, but you don't have to show what happens after, right? That's the point where they won. But then again, they went back to his anti-hero nature where he is truly this ineffectual guy. He loses the Ark for the museum, right? The government takes it away and they put it into this warehouse somewhere. He is a finder. That's what he does. So he's trekked all over the world for this. He can't find a warehouse and rescue it from the warehouse? Come on. <laughs> well, then, the, the, the last scene, and I, this annoyed me when I was a kid, the last scene for their relationship was him coming out of the building so frustrated, right, with what's going on about his archaeology and the frustration of this is not where it's supposed to be accessible to people and protected from those who would abuse it. He's running back and forth up the stairs and she's following him in this skirt and heels back and forth and back and forth. And here I am, Indy, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. I felt it was very sad for her character. What a sad way for her character to end that story, mm. to be panting after him and he's essentially ignoring her. Ugh. But that's the whole movie. I know, but it didn't have to be. And there was still some hope that he would be her hero and really rescue her and take her away. And then there was no more hope left because he was ignoring her. They were safe and he was ignoring her. Oh, it well, annoyed Steph, me. I think that's the saddest thing I've ever heard you say. But there was no hope left. <laughs> well, you know, there, there you have it. It annoyed me. But the rest of the film is nostalgic enough that I can pretty much forget about the end. And just enjoy the movie. Okay. Well, then let's actually talk about the story problem with mm. Indiana Jones. Here okay. it is. <laughs> I, I need a moment to giggle because <laughs> I'm a huge Big Bang Theory fan and I loved this episode. <laughs> okay, I'm done giggling. Um, Matthew, do you want to do this part since you're the one who, who mostly brought it to my attention? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. In a seventh season episode of The Big Bang Theory, Sheldon finally gets Amy to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. She proceeds to ruin the movie for everyone in the gang by pointing out that Indiana Jones is irrelevant to the story. Everything that happens in the movie would have happened had he not been there. Um, I think we'll link to that scene on YouTube in the show notes. Steph, what do you think about this point? I think Amy Farrafella had it right. Go, girl. It's, mm -hmm. it's part of that ineffectualness of the indie anti-hero that even in the end, he doesn't get the arc. Yeah. Well, and uh, his actions didn't impact anything that happened. You know, he was there and the Nazis got the arc. If he hadn't been there, they still would have gotten the arc and died. You know, I he just he didn't do anything. And, and in fact, before he got there, they were digging in the wrong place. Well, they were digging in the wrong place only because they hadn't actually purchased the jewel the from the medallion, thank you, from Marion. And if they had just made a flat purchase from Marion, she probably would have left Nepal, found a real man, and had lived happily ever after, right? So, right. So they wouldn't, if, if Indy hadn't been part of the story, they would never have been digging in the wrong place anyway because they would have had what they needed. Right. Um, and in that episode of Big Bang, the guys talk all of this through and they uh, they come to the same conclusion. <laughs> um, I just thought it was a really well done episode for fans of Raiders and how ironic that even after watching that episode and even after having this discussion and all of the other many discussions I've had over the last 30 years, I still love the movie and I'll still watch it 10 times next month. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely you love what you love and like we said earlier critiquing something or even criticizing something does not preclude you from loving it in fact i think that means you love it even more because you love it despite its flaws exactly yes and like you were saying it speaks to a very specific moment in time for you so i think that's a big part of it and mm -hmm. the the reason why I'm able to let go of some of my more mature, intelligent thoughts about film and feminism and adventure. Yeah. And and it is problematic in the way this and other films treat women. And if we point it out, maybe it'll uh, get people to write something better in the future. Hear that all you women out there? Write film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Succeed. Absolutely. Yes. Do you still want to ask me this next question, Steph? Oh, what, what, I, I must have scrolled right past it. What was it? 
about Ferris Bueller? Oh, yeah. You know, in your thoughts, <laughs> you said that Ferris Bueller's probably related to Indy. I, I am slightly afraid, but how'd you get there? Because both of them seem to have this sort of incredible luck. I think I actually wrote this during the scene, uh, the car chase scene, where Indy is, you know, holding on to the bottom of the, the truck that's just driving, and then he comes out the front, and even though everything's bending off, he still manages to hold on, and he doesn't get hurt. Like, Indy's just kind of got the best luck ever. <laughs> I mean, yeah, bad things do kind of happen, but he doesn't die. He doesn't get maimed. You know, there's no actual physical ramification to anything that he did. And so, you know, I had just recently watched Ferris Bueller. And and one of the things that Matthew and I had talked about in that was just how incredibly lucky Ferris Bueller is. And so I was kind of just getting that same sense of it doesn't matter what you try to do. I don't want to say you're going to succeed because we we very clearly talked about how Indy never succeeds, but he doesn't <laughs> actually horribly fail either. Right. You know, I mean, when when you can have a fight scene by crawling underneath a moving truck and not die, I think you're kind of winning at life a little bit. <laughs> so okay. that, that's where so that comparison. The luck from. comparison. I I'm. Yeah. I have a minor giggle going in the back of my head because we were talking earlier in the podcast about the indie theme and how it didn't match the indie character. And so now I'm thinking about all of these iconic moments with Indiana Jones, starting out with boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't it give you a giggle? Come on. <laughs> so. Anyway, I I okay. was afraid to approach it, and now I have that. I think the next time I watch Indiana Jones in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm going to have the Ferris Bueller music running in the back of my head. And yes, if Mandy, I will blame you, but <laughs> I will accept full responsibility for that. I can absolutely see it in the bit where he shoots the guy with the sword. Just shoots him. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great perfect okay is there anything else that we need to talk about with raiders um before we wrap up then steph do you recommend the indiana jones sequels to amanda i actually would recommend the third i would say if you're if you want to see just another fun adventure film and especially if you're a sean connery fan see that one but I wouldn't see any of the others because they were stupid and boring. So. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just amused that you're saying if I want to see another fun adventure film when this oh, one was not a fun adventure film. So I'm not sure you're really Oops. selling me on that point. <laughs> Oh, I, I completely, you're right. I completely missed that. So let me put this another way. If you're a Sean Connery film and you want to see how he makes an Indiana Jones film better, see the third one. Okay. Fair enough. And, and actually, uh, then a question for Mandy, I think. Knowing how relaxed you are about only seeing bits of a series, could you watch the first and third film in a series? In this case, I could because Temple of Doom is a prequel. Okay. So I could completely... Plus, I would want to skip that one anyway because it scarred me for life as a kid. I really don't need to go through <laughs> that again. Um, okay, I think we put the third one on, on the list then. Damn it. And <laughs> there's something that I think we should... <laughs> um, something I think we should be asking everyone who comes on. Uh, Steph, is there any other film that had a strong effect on you or that you love just as much that you think should be on Mandy's list? I think there are a number of them, and I've actually added to Mandy's list, but I will say on a completely non sequitur, other than the fact that it is um, one of those for which I I watched nostalgically and have to totally let go of every feminist instinct in order to watch it, The Guys and Dolls with Brando and Sinatra, a must-see. Brando sings, or tries to. It's a must-see. Huh. Mandy, have you intriguing. seen that? I have not. The only Marlon Brando film I've ever seen is The Godfather, so... Okay. I've never seen that. I'll have to watch your podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to picture Vito Corleone singing. It's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a challenge 
to watch those scenes. But if you get through them, the rest of the movie is worth it. You're not really selling me on this movie either, uh, Steph. Yeah. No, this is why I don't do sales. <laughs> <laughs> How how is he on the scale of Hugh Jackman to Russell Crowe? Um, you know, I've never heard either of those guys sing. I will say the story. Oh, oh, stop the podcast! Yeah. I'm getting off. <laughs> okay, Steph, we need to have an, a Hugh Jackman edu- ed- education for you. <laughs> yeah, education. <laughs> yes, I almost said education. You weren't supposed to pick up on that. <laughs> That's my tool. Um, I, you know, I have one of the reasons that I love your podcast is because there are so many iconic pop culture films that I have not experienced that, you know, it's, it'd be really nice to, to just hear about somebody else's experience. Who I'm not the only one out there who hasn't seen these big films. Yeah, you're not, you know, when I started this, I really thought that it was it was going to be me all by myself in the sea of people who have seen everything and I, <laughs> Matthew you're the sea of, of people <laughs> <laughs> no when I say sea of people I mean you know like Twitter and, and the interwebs and all of those mm-hmm. things but we've gotten so much feedback and it just it makes my heart happy every time I get you know something from somebody saying oh well I haven't seen that either I need to go watch that because it, it just it makes me feel like I'm not alone Mm-hmm. And I really thought I was, that I was the only person on the world, in the world, who had never seen some of these movies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, feedback is great, and it stokes my ego, and it's wonderful, and people should just keep telling me wonderful things about the podcast. Do we have enough time for me to rack up all the wonderful things, Mandy? I don't think so. Oh. Sorry, that, that was, was the sound of my that head was getting the... bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it was a perfect response from Matthew as well. Oh. <laughs> Um, but on, on the feedback, actually, we, we have had, uh, tweets and we've had emails. We've had people actually talk to us like in real life people. And what we want to do was mention some of it because there's some really good thoughts that everyone's been bringing up for us. Mandy's friend Reed suggested that, uh, we should mention how we watch the movie, um, or, or the show that we're discussing. So right up top, we, we have now added that in. I know we've done it incidentally once or twice. My friend Simon followed up on a discussion from the very first episode, Die Hard. There was a a scene in the Die Hard trailer that I couldn't remember being in the film. We've gone back and checked, and it is not in the film. I think it might be our earliest example yet of a trailer that has content that wasn't in the movie itself. I, I will be interested to find if there are more like that. There was a lot of feedback to the Clerks episode, uh, some really strong reactions from it. Brandon suggested that Mandy should watch the movie Waiting, uh, which has now gone on the on the list. And Lashipa on Twitter said that it's worth watching Clerks 2 if you treat, um, treat it like a Mystery Science Theater 3000 and you just riff the whole time. Otherwise, it's pretty intolerable. Spoiler uh, alert, I'm never going to watch Clerks 2, you guys. <laughs> Not going to happen. It has some great stuff in it. It has some truly terrible stuff in it as well, so I- I'm not sure I can recommend it either. But Holly can, so yeah, go ahead and uh, tell us what Holly said about it, because she really loved it. Yeah, Holly uh, Holly MVG had some fascinating comments. Uh, I've got a quote from her saying, I love Clerks because I first saw it in my 20s while working retail. Our criticisms of the movie are right, of course, but it sounded like you assumed you were supposed to like the characters. I've always thought they were all terrible people. Like the slut shaming, yes, attitudes are different now, but even in their responses then were not okay. It's intentionally poor. I also think it's intentionally pointless. The original ending it takes that to the ultimate end, which is too far for me, but I do see it. It's hard to explain how real it felt, how raw, when it is clearly ridiculous. The movie captures a moment in time for me, and it makes perfect sense that you would hate it watching it now. Far removed from that moment, I would hate it now too. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's the thing. People who saw it back in the 90s when it first came out, it's, an, it's a nostalgia thing. It's It was a different time. We were all a lot younger back then. And so I, I totally understand why folks like Stephanie, who was on that episode with me, really loves it why holly really loves it i just don't have that sentimentality attached to it yeah and it's it's reminiscent of some of the stuff you've been saying today steph yeah. um, about you know raiders is a very specific point in time for you uh, yeah, and that's I why you enjoy those, it quite so much those last three sentences say it all you know it right 
Absolutely. Those last few sentences say it all in terms of just about all of the the stuff that I loved at that age, at that time. Some of it bears up through time, but that has to be really classic content. If you want to get in touch and give us your comments on Raiders or any other movie we've discussed, you can tweet at us on Twitter at eloquentgushing or use the show hashtag, hashtag PC Deprived, which is a little bit shorter than what we had originally been using. But guys, it's just really hard to type out pop culturally deprived every time. You can also email us at podcast at eloquentgushing.com or you can comment on this post on eloquentgushing.com. Individually, I'm at Mandy K. And I'm at Matthew Vos. Please also remember to rate and review us on iTunes. It's the number one best way to help people discover the show. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where Matthew and I will talk about The Godfather. Until next time, I'm Mandy K. And I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. <laughs>